sets your butane torches to high and your expectations to low. Coming to you from the Cigar Cave in the hills of Steel City, get ready to get your fix. This is the Cigar Junkies Podcast. Welcome to the Cigar Junkies Podcast. The cigar show for the community by the community. A forum that talks stogies, booze, food, and anything else in the cigar lifestyle. If you're looking for ratings, negativity, or an authority on all things cigars, you came to the wrong place. Whether you like what you hear or not, please join the conversation and let us know by finding us at the Cigar Junkies Facebook group or contacting us at thecigarjunkies at gmail.com. What's What's up, junkies? It is a special, special day. Special. We have the frustrated man himself joining us via Zoom. But wait, it's going to get more frustrating. Get at it. They just commented they can't hear him. They cannot hear him. They cannot hear him. Wow. Of course, that comment came as we played mm-hmm. the intro. Okay, we have the mute Steve Saka. <laughs> so you heard him. You can say whatever you want, and uh, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, uh, just <laughs> give us a moment to fix our broken cork for you now. Because we, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we have some. A whole slew of technical difficulties today to include a camera issue, which is excluding Mr. Dave Pustovich, who's joining us. Uh, so he is unable to be facially recognizable during this escapade. Um, and then, as you guys can see but not hear, Mr. Saka. And, uh, yeah, Corey is now playing with his favorite thing. Uh, to preface a little bit, Steve, you know, you were saying you're having a, a bit of a rough start to your day. Corey has been basically basically all day just troubleshooting this this system because it is just fighting back nonstop. Indeed. So we're going to have, you know, the standard like 30 seconds delay to the Facebook live crowd. Um, but I believe I did something that'll make okay. an effect. So we'll wait and see. What the well, we need him to say so. something for that to happen. So hello, Steve. No, okay, that did not work. That didn't. You paid oh, the you shit. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, somebody in the comments let us know if you can hear <laughs> oh that was fantastic oh man no sounds Patty says still mm. I don't know what the sound is. which means you can get away with well no there is a recorded version of this which is it... <laughs> oh. Oh, so so what was the bottle that you uh, snapped the cork off of pre-show there? So the Waldron by Lock One out of Syracuse, New York. Oh, so for you guys that can't hear Steve, he said that it's special because it is a rye whiskey fish in chestnut. That dude, that sounds really intriguing. Is it like a a sweet and chestnut kind of sensation on the backside of it, or is it? Yeah, I think what it does is so I'm not a big rye guy. I, I find most ryes to be a little bit too peppery and a little too fiery for me. And for whatever reason, him finishing it with the chestnut and I don't chestnut barrels. I don't know, drops, you know, chestnut stays in. I don't know how he does it, but it, it just kind of softens it. It smooths out the the rough edges. It just makes it a, a little bit more, for me, more palatable. And uh, I really, I really like this one a lot. It's just, it's an excellent, it's an excellent juice. All right. Um, Mr. Puskovich, would you mind speaking in for a second? Because I have to test this. Hello, Steve. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. I'm good. So, by the way, the, the I positive. love the fact that you're taking that broke back cowboy persona. That's really, that really fits you well, my friend. Oh, so you're back to Sam on that one, right? <laughs> <He's> <laughs> broke back mountain. I'm just looking at Dave's photo. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So Dave's actually live with us. He, uh, he's not calling in. That's just the, uh, our monitor to be able to see you while we talk to you. Uh, that is the logo ah. for just the tip cigars. Yeah. Got so it. we. Uh, We only, one of the worst things about doing that, well, there's a million terrible things about doing a Zoom, a Zoom guest. But uh, one of them, other than the guest not being audible for a while, is the fact that I can only use one camera input. So I cannot switch back and forth to show you Dave. But 
If you've seen one old guy that works at a cigar store, you've seen them all. <laughs> well, he, he, he can just do a cameo, standing between the two of you, right? Yeah, he could do that, or yeah. Sam, Sam could remotely. Sam could turn the camera if it if it really becomes pertinent. Yeah, we kind of swing out. It could, you know, snuggle time. Uh, he, time. You you go that way. <laughs> Careful of all the power cords. We we had. Uh, Mickey, Are we gonna attempt this for real? Well, we need to switch him to that mic. So there's there's. All a, right, I mean, right. if he just wants to jump in and be seen, we could do that. It's your call. Hard to do that. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, because I can grab that mic and swing. Yeah, typical there. cigar smoker doesn't want to fight inertia. So you know what I mean. One of one of the best things that we've had happen on this show in terms of uh, technical difficulties is. During a live show, Mickey Pegg stood up in the room here <laughs> yeah. and bumped into the power supply for the entire rig and <laughs> shut <laughs> everything off. <laughs> Just hard that, stop. That Mickey Pegg. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> was it a sober or an inebriated yeah. Mickey Pegg? That would be the latter of the two. I, I would say it was yeah. relatively sober. <laughs> no, not at that point. No? Not at that point. Yeah, no. that's fair. I don't know. He's a big guy. I figure he could probably he could probably metabolize a lot of alcohol. How you doing, Dave? You look good, man. He said, he said you look good, man. Oh. <laughs> you do. This isn't awkward at all. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. this is just so wrong. Go sit back down, dude. He said, sit back down. Yeah, yeah. Well, if Steve wasn't confident uh, that he could say whatever he wants without fear of yeah. being seen before, I'm I'm sure the bar is set. He's for like, him. all right, I get it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we refuse to stick to that whole like professionalism thing. It's no fun. Not that we could attain it if we wanted to. Yeah, that's probably why we do it. You know, I, I do so many of these podcasts, right? A lot. More than really. It's a sin how many I do. But I have a hard time saying no, right? If somebody's like, hey, would you like to come and talk on my show? Well, why wouldn't I say yes, right? That's what we appreciate I mean, about you. <laughs> Right. Look, I, I want to reach all three of your viewers, right? I mean, there might be there might be three guys that have never smoked one of my cigars. So, no, but uh, but in all sincerity, um, the quality of the interviewer really determines the quality of the program. Ooh, that's I can only do so much. I, right. There's nothing I haven't said a billion times over. So it's really weird. Some of the some of the really really good ones are from out in left field that you wouldn't expect, you know, and oftentimes they're either ones that go completely off the rails because off the rails is always entertaining. Yeah. Or the other one is you're dealing with someone that really, um, they don't really have, they've done a lot of research and they skip over a lot of the, Oh, how did you get into it? And yeah. you know, blah, 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 blah. It's a, it's a shit you say all the time and it, it really, it makes a difference. So, yeah, well, I don't know. We'll we, see what happens here. We, I don't we, have plan on over, it like. <laughs> we plan on skipping over pretty much all the how'd you get into it, what have you done, all that, because you've answered that so many times. Uh, but that's one of our keynotes that we do on pretty much every show. Is we, Unless it's somebody who's not well-known or something like that that's on here, we, uh, right. we tend to avoid that stuff. Because, as you said, you've done it so many times. We don't need to know that you're from New England area. We don't need to know that you make cigars. We covered that. And the, and the other thing too, is I think a lot of people, they feel as though they need to make it so that it's almost a little bit of a package sales pitch. And the reality is that you couldn't be further from the truth because that's really the last thing that the type of people that watch these programs want to see. Uh, you know what I mean? Cause you're like an Uber cigar junkie. If you're watching like four fucking people, you know, smoking and talking about cigars on a Friday night, yep. right? So you, you're 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 so beyond that shtick that it really has no value at all, and it's actually kind of annoying. I think. I mean, I I know I I know I don't like to watch it. Right. Yeah. I mean, at that point, it's a commercial. I could have recorded a commercial, put it on my website. You can see it there. Why Why are you here? And that's basically our logic too. So that's it. So you've actually, uh, you're, you seem to be the guest that comes with an instruction manual. I know. I like, I like it. Like Which it. was actually, you know, like it's too late for us to say it now. But that was how we planned to approach the show. <laughs> I, mean, I believe you actually, I mean, I, I'm looking at my show notes, which that's like the one thing we do semi-professional. And it, there's a section on here that just says, let Steve ramble. So, oh, that's well, true. we're set now. <laughs> <laughs> so... Why don't we go ahead and get ourselves on pace here? Let's go ahead and uh, we'll run our quick little commercial for just the uh, tip cigar of the week. And then we'll let Steve tell us what it is this Ooh. week. Yeah. 
It's time for the Cigar of the Week, brought to you by Just a Tip Cigars. Are you looking for the best selection of boutique cigars? Do you want the tried and true legacy brands that are synonymous with the cigar lifestyle? Do you want luxurious cutters, lighters, and other accessories? Do you want to relax in the most comfortable cigar lounge in the burg? Then you want Just a Tip Cigars. Conveniently located in the Bavarian Village Shopping Center in South Park, Pennsylvania, Just a Tip Cigars has been tailor-built to your smoking needs. Whether you visit in person or on the web at justatipcigars.com, when it comes to cigars, Just a Tip is the whole package. Well, that, that was my yeah. test to see if Steve could hear the commercial, and he did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I had almost nothing to do with its creation at all he named the shop what was that's that it yeah i named the shop just a tip i i i, I kind of begged for that so, oh god here's the question you. We, you know most brand most store owners are really terrible at naming their shops okay <laughs> they really are they're pretty bad it's havana this or this or, i mean Leaf, it's smoke. like the same name 800 times over i thought mine was pretty and good then, and then you get these other ones where the name is so esoteric that nobody has a fucking clue what you sell. <laughs> I will give you credit. This is arguably one of the worst names I've ever heard. Yes. I mean, it really is. Yes. It is special. And exactly. it's definitely a memorable name. And I will say that when we, I don't know what it was. I don't know when it's when you guys open an account or whatever. But I heard every girl in the office giggle. Okay. And it made me go, what are you guys giggling about? I go, oh, you can't wait till you see this shop name. Right? And I go, okay, what is it? And they go, just the tip. And I said, are you fucking with me? Really? Just the tip? Oh, you don't ever have to open it. You've accomplished I everything. I think you I'm done. I'm good. I'm out. Like this problem solved. So, Steve, has it been communicated to you what we're smoking today? Oh yeah, I didn't tell. Um, you. We're smoking. I, I posted the graphic like like 22 minutes ago. I was in such a rush, so I assume we're smoking Umbagog because I I grabbed one on the way out of the office to make sure I had one. We are smoking the Umbagog uh, Churchill. Uh, so why don't you tell us about uh, this particular cigar, where it came from, and what it means to you? Um, so so Umbagog is really kind of a byproduct brand. Um, and what I mean by that is, so Meat K. Rita is our top tier Connecticut broadleaf cigar. And I always wanted the kappa, the wrappers on the broadleaf to be like super, super cherry for the brand. Um, but the problem that you have is you don't get just cherry wrapper. I mean, I know we all say everything's great, best ever, yada, yada, yada. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is you're buying entire crops. And then what you're having to do is you're then having to cure it, sort it, ferment it, resort it, ferment it, resort it, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you end up with some that are like really super pretty. And you end up with some that are really pretty, but not as pretty. You end up with some that are, eh, they're sevens. And, but you end up with a lot of fives and sixes. And then there's a whole group that are like all fours, right? They're definitely like 2 a.m. brown baggers. You got to be a few shots in. Um, so you always, in order to maintain the quality of the aesthetic that I wanted for me, Kirita, but also not lose my ass dollar wise, I needed to have a home for the wrapper that I didn't deem to be as aesthetically pleasing. And so what I did is I created a secondary brand called Umbagog. And that is where those wrappers go to live. Now, if you look at an average Umbagog, it's prettier than a lot of the 12 to 14 15 dollar cigars on the market. Now, one of the things you have to understand, though, is we're sorting that wrapper before it's ending up on the table. So we're looking at the whole leaf. And when it ends up on the table and you're taking that tenderloin cut out across by the rib, it ends up looking much different because you're really only taking about an inch and a half swipe. And it's then being spiral around the cigar. So then you really only think visibly you know, two and a half twists, you're seeing the face of about an inch, right? So sometimes you'll get an umbagog and you'll be like, wow, this wrapper is gorgeous, right? Why is it on an umbagog? Those cigars, they kind of piss me off because I really <laughs> wish that wrapper had been used on me, K. Rita. The other thing that I think for some, and also then the blend of me, K. Rita, it's not quite me, K. Rita. It's a little bit more loosey goosey. Um, the materials don't match identically. It has, it has a lot of shared common materials, but again, the same thing. I tend to put the most choicest of the materials in the 
in the Miki Rita. And then I put the, I put the, you know, the, the eights and the sevens in Umbagog. So Umbagog isn't as consistent, in my opinion, as Miki Rita is. Umbagog, it's the same general flavor profile, but it can vary some from bundle to bundle. Some bundles you'll find to be a little stronger. Some bundles you'll find to be a little milder. It's much more like a typical premium handmade cigar that you get in a box for 12 bucks. Not that it's bad, okay? Not that it isn't great, but it isn't really super, super tippy top shelf, right? And I think one of the things that, because I explain this to consumers, I think where they get confused often is they tend to think of it as a segundo, but it's not a segundo, it's a primera. It's made intentionally to be an umbagog. I mean, that, that is what its intent was. It isn't like we make Nikkei Ritas and then we take the ugly Nikkei Ritas and we make them into umbagogs. What we do with the ugly Nikkei Ritas is we take the wrapper off them and we react to them with a wrapper that's much more attractive. So it is distinctly a different line. And it's not a segundo because the cigars in umbagog, they have to go through the same quality control that everything goes through. There's, there's not a different quality level between my lowest price brand and my highest price brand. We don't have, I mean, yeah, there's certain things that we're pickier about here and there, of course, but when it comes to draw and burn and all those basic cornerstones that are involved with construction and smoking, it's not like, oh, well, these are just umbagog, so they can just be, you know what I mean? There isn't that kind of attitude when it comes to umbagog. So when we first started doing the Kerita production, there weren't many umbagog. Um, they kind of got released in batches as we would build up wrapper that I didn't deem worthy of being on Mikey Rita. Now, as Mikey Rita as a brand has grown, uh, when did we launch it? 2016 with the first one, the blue one, right? Um, I now have to buy a lot more material. And as I'm buying more material, it's getting to the point now that there's almost always wrapper that allows me to make Umbagog day in, day out. And that's what we do. And for me, it's about dollar cost averaging because I don't pay less for the wrapper that's on an Umbagog than what I pay for the wrapper that goes on a Mike Rita, right? So I need to find a way to absorb that cost because if I didn't and I just sold that broadleaf off secondhand rather than converting it into a sellable cigar, it would make the Mike Rita prices instantly in the same price as Liga Pravada. I mean, they would be $17, $18 cigars. So Umbagog kind of serves as a way to try to maintain the cost on me, K. Rita, and supplement by also having Umbagog. And you'll notice in the packaging, too, I, I spend no money. Yeah. It's literally my cheapest band, simple paper, no embossing, simple white, you know, generic macaroni and cheese sticker on the bundle. I mean, I, I do it as cheap as I possibly can do it. Because for me, I need Umbagogs to sell because umbagogs are what's allowing me to continue my Mike Rita production and also keep my Mike Rita costs in line, you know? Um, so, so for me, umbagog ends up being my cheapest date currently. Um, they typically retail out at about eight to $10, which I think, you know, for some consumers are going to look and go, it's in a fucking bundle. It's got a <laughs> shitty band on it, right? Well, well, why is this, you know, eight to 10 bucks? The reason why is it's, it's genuinely like a $12 cigar. You know, it, it really truly is. And I just keep it packaged super, super light is what I do. For what it's worth, this is actually my favorite cigar in the Dunbarton lineup. And it has nothing to do with the quality of the other cigars. It just happens that this cigar hits my palate a little bit more than the other ones do. So um, another thing that's a little odd is uglier broadleaf wrapper oftentimes turns out to have a little bit more flavor. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like you, you see those China doll model girls. Yeah. They're super, super hot, but the one that's pretty, but has been around a little bit, she's a little bit more fun and it's no yeah. different when it comes to the way broadleaf wrapper works. So sometimes that wrapper that has a bit more pronounced vein, a little bit of rough grain here and there, it tends to be a it tends to be a very flavorful wrapper, and uh, so I, I can see why. And look, you're not alone. There are plenty of consumers that prefer Umbagog um, over me Rita. Um, but for the luckily for me, it doesn't tend to be the norm. Yeah. Me Rita is a much more consistent 
higher tier yeah. cigar. Well, like you said, but you, you need them you're both. necessarily going to like it better. You need them both to sell, right? So you know. right, they're 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 right. They're 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 symbiotic to one another, right? They're connected. I need them both to work. And in fact, you're going to see me do a project either the tail end of this year or next year, where I have a very similar scenario now with brulee. Brulee's okay. production has gotten so large that I'm now ending up with wrapper that's a little ruddy, a little marked up, a little bit of Monchar. And, you know, what, what am I supposed to do with this wrapper? I'm still paying the same $42 a pound to get the wrapper, but I don't want to sort it and put it in a box of uh, brulee. And that doesn't you know even I mean? include all of the sugar that you're having to buy. <laughs> of course, that's very expensive. So, I mean, so, I mean, it's one of these things where I'm going to probably have to do something similar with brulee to balance out the tobacco utilization and for it to just make, you know, cost sense to, to me, which in turn ultimately trickles down to the consumer, right? If I can utilize these materials in a, in a productive way, then it keeps their costs lower per unit on the overall portfolio. So I, I, I'm going to just accept my ignorance here. Is there any reason, let's say you end up with a surplus of brulee wrapper and you couldn't, use that as binder or filler for something else is that well any- typically look wrapper is typically a little thin so it doesn't tend to make really good binders because i mean a binder the binder is essentially the corset on the bunch right right so it needs to have a certain amount of texture and thickness and a certain level of elasticity that's even greater than the than the wrapper but it also needs to be firm enough that it doesn't allow the cigar to expand so there's no way you could use a uh, the Connecticut shade wrappers that we're utilizing on brulee as a binder. Now you could get away with using the broadleaf as a binder, but here's the problem. Broadleaf tends to be rough and it tends to be bumpy. So when you tend to use a broadleaf binder, it tends to make the cigar ugly because the wrapper over top of it, you know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of like, it's kind of I can wear the sexiest shirt in the world, but I'm still a fat fuck under the shirt <laughs> and you can see that. Right. <laughs> and it would be the same thing if you were to take these broadleaf wrappers and make them, your binder in a lot of cases. That makes sense. Ryan Seneca in the chat room says that if you were to smoke uh, the Umbagog and the Mikorita blindfolded, that he would bet that Steve Sock is the only one that could tell them apart. <laughs> um, that that may be true. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I hear that all the time. I mean, I, I hear both ways. I hear customers argue that they're so different that how can you not tell? And I hear other customers say, I, I can't tell the difference at all when I smoke them blind. Wow. I, I can see either way. Look, it's a very similar blend with the same wrap, right? It is. So I can tell the difference yet. But whether the average consumer can or can't, well, that, that's up to them. And if they can't, then fuck, save the money and buy the <laughs> you know, if you, don't, if you don't want the nice box and the nice band and all of that nonsense, then yeah, so there's Steve, no reason to, to, to spend the extra coin. Steve's asking you guys to take out his trash. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I feel bad I even saying that. Trash. Like, yes, it's a I mean, I mean, when he's living in a neighborhood that he is throwing away his trash, that shit's treasure to us. You uh, know right. what I mean? All right, all right, fair enough. I've gone out on a few Dude, trash. Days. I live in a neighborhood that I have to go to the dump with my trash. So I don't know what you guys are thinking. That's not <laughs> a bad thing. Uh, yeah. I want to. I want to open up with a fun question here. Unless you have something to interject. No, I just. I did want to. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be real quick. Um, one thing I don't know if I told you or not, or if we covered, but uh, we do run a live chat during this. Um, and any comment, comments or questions that we have come in, I'll feed back to you um, if we deem it a question worth asking. So Filtered. if you get pop, yeah, and I'll for do me, my best. And honestly, nothing's off limits. If I think it's a totally bonehead douchey question, I'll just say that's a bonehead douchey question. Yes, uh, speaking of which, <laughs> my first question is, the Sokka Squatch really modeled after you? Did you have to post? Oh, no. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, Sokka Squatch is first aspirational. First have you seen the body the Saka Squatch has? Hey, look, look at all that hair. Good God, no. The Saka Squatch is definitely an aspirational representation in my fantasy. <laughs> we what don't are we know. About here? We don't know what's going on under all those those layers. Because what was I? I was thinking. Dude, was just the the Squatch, the question. But the Saka Squatch doesn't. He doesn't have a package, much less just the tip, right? So <laughs> I definitely. So there are some ad, anatomical differences there, yeah, right? right? So, uh, <laughs> This is going exactly Again, the way we, I wanted it to. We don't know what's going on over there. We don't know if there's anatomical differences. In, in today's day and age, you're not allowed to ask. My, my I, thoughts I mean, were. Oddly enough, when I was young, 
before I became the you know the uh, job of the hut individual that I had become, I was I was I was actually a pretty buff fit guy in my young years. But uh, it's been a long, long time, and that was long before I was in the cigar business. So you were, no, no one no one ever saw the uh, the 185 to 225 pound Saka. It's uh, <laughs> they missed that one all the time. Huh? You were yeah. you were military, right? I'm sorry. You were military, right? I was uh, ex Navy. I okay. enlisted. I was a squid. I was on a skimmer. I was on an old. Uh, I was on an old Knox class frigate. For I was enlisted for six years. I was on the boat for about four of those years. Well, thank you for your service. I guess that takes out my next question because I was going to say if you were actually that hairy, maybe we could you could do a partnership with like a uh, men's hair removal company <laughs> and call it Sockus Gate. Oh yeah. God, dude, you're getting you're you're going for it here, aren't you? Oh, I'm Ooh. going for it. Yeah. Ooh. Th that, that was... it, would it would require ass shots in order to sell the product. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so keen on that. Oh, some of them fanboys out there, you never know. <laughs> Especially some you of those just you, a tip is, this is something that you do have no clue about. I would say that pretty much three times a month, I will get a dick fit. Okay, <laughs> there, it is unbelievable. How many gay guys out there that are into cigar smoking and are into bears? Okay. The amount of solicitation <laughs> is really unbelievable. You have no idea how improved my life became when Facebook Messenger started blurring the photos, right? So that they didn't instantly <laughs> pop up. So that you had a chance to like, okay, hit it once and see it a little unblurred. You're like, okay, I know I don't have to see this. I know what's going on here, right? So, so, so I, I got to ask you, did you ever see anything? You were like, whoa, just, the, you know, not not the instant, like, what the hell, but like something you were like, oh, that's different. Yeah, come on. I'm Sometimes it's fucking uh, really impressive, right? You got to give the guy <laughs> hey, give props where props are due. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so that's the real soccer squash right there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that's, uh, I, I did not so see that one coming. No. I, I, think that's, like, I, that's I can't saying. even imagine what it's like for women online. Right. Right. I mean, I, I can't even imagine the amount of crap they must get oh, sent yeah. on an endless basis. I feel like, uh, the next Umbagog size is going to be like a four and a half by 60 and it's going to be the bear. The bear. <laughs> the bear. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's an option. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right. Well, he already has a bear. Who has a bear? Doesn't uh, Mike from Cigar Hutzler and his brand? Who can keep track? Obviously, it's not yeah. in reference to, you know, the solicitation dick pics that we're sure, talking about. But, it's not. But it, I, think he, I think he has something that's kind of patterned after a bear. War, war bear? Yeah, yeah war yeah, bear. War bear, yeah. Yeah. I have no clue on that one. Wooly bear? No, dude, no, just, no, okay. no. All right. How about this one? Are cigars still fun for you, Ooh. or were they ever? You know, like you're, so you're. Okay, so no, that's a good question, actually. Um, so look, the reason I got into cigars was because I was just an Uber geek, right? So for me, just breathing, living, eating. I will say, you know, look, I've been actually in the business side of things since about ninety six, ninety seven. And then really hardcore since 2000, um, you know, because it was at that point that I went to work as an exec consultant for JR Cigars. So when you go from being the uber passionate cigar geek and you're then an exec at JR Cigar back in the Lou Rothman days, um, it takes a lot of bloom off the rose really, really quick, right? You, you get a serious dose of reality. I will say I still love cigars and I love the blending of cigars. And I do occasionally enjoy smoking cigars, but I do have to do a lot that's just work related. And look, it's a job. It's a grind. Like I'm having a, I'm having a ball buster of a week. I was in Nika last week on Monday. I'm supposed to be in Vegas. I had to leave Sunday for the TPE. I've been here this week. I literally have been working like 18 hours a day trying to catch up. Like I was in the office till 420 yesterday AM. You know what I mean? So I'm here talking to you guys now. When I'm done talking to you, guess where I'm going? I'm going right back to the office. So it isn't quite the romantic vision that the people from the outside perceive it to be. At the same time, though, uh, it's not like I have a taskmaster with a whip that's forcing me to make these bad life choices. 
right. and to do this, right? So it's something that I'm doing because I want to do it. But yes, definitely being in the business definitely sucks. Some of that just, oh my God, I love cigars. This has got to, you know what I mean? It, it's, it is definitely different. Um, but I'm supposed to fake it because consumers don't want to hear the reality. They want, they want, they want, you know, they want, they want everything prepackaged. So no, it's the best goddamn thing in the world. I just love it every day. And I really could never <laughs> even think of like, anything else. It's the, my true passion and my absolute joy. It's my, it's my entire life. Cigars. Yeah. I'm so there glad you that go. we asked him yeah. that on a rough week. Is that um, you know, I knew he was going to give an honest answer. And here's the thing that anybody that's ever heard Steve talk, I mean, you're, you're a very blunt man, right? And and you're very detailed and intellectual about scientific about your approach to cigars. But I know that you have interest in other things that are related to anything that's in, on palate, whether it's beverages, food, cigars, whatever it is. Um, and, and sometimes I don't, I don't really know. And, it, and, it's, and I'm a redneck at heart. I love fishing, hunting, ATVing, you know, anything that involves a sharp object, anything that actually you know, it has a trigger on it. I love all that stuff. The sad part is I really haven't had much time for anything um, over the last seven years. This is, uh, I think I got very spoiled, you know, because when I was at JR as an exec, we had, you know, 1,500 employees. And when I was president of Drew Estate, we had over 1,700 employees. So it was kind of like minion after minion after minion. Now it's pretty much, it's a small family company. There's literally, I don't even know how many people are on the payroll. I'd have to count it on my fingers, but it definitely isn't over 10, right? And Cindy and me are two of them. And my daughter-in-law, Anna, is a third. So it, it's, yeah, you got Amber, you got Yvonne, you got Casey, you got Allie, and you got uh, Matt in the warehouse. And then you got Dave Lafferty. And that literally is the entire Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust team. And... I handle everything as it relates to cigars, tobacco, Nicaragua, production, packaging, design, development, trademark. Um, I'm pretty much the only person that does any significant social media. Not that the other people don't, but they just do it casually. Um, Dave's pretty good. Dave does quite a bit. You know, My wife really slacks on it. I kind of carp at her every once in a while, but that's like barking up a tree. What's the point of that? Right. And um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I'm really, I'm really super stressed and super overloaded. And what I really need to do is I need to just say, I'm going to take a year off. And when I say take a year off, I don't mean stop working and go on some fucking sabbatical and cross my legs and do yoga. And, um, no one but I mean, kind of like not absorb so many new projects. Right. But the problem is it's really hard. You know, it's, you got, so for like every exclusive that you see me do, I'm turning down about seven or eight. Oh, wow. I mean, uh, I just turned out a project with a very famous pop star. Okay. Like really famous, crazy famous. Okay. That happens to smoke brulee and she really wanted to do something. And, and I just had to be like, I wish I could, but I can't, you know what I mean? It's just not there. Um, yeah. It's uh Look, these are great problems to have, yeah. right? I mean, they are. So I'm bitching about things being good. But also, when things are really good, you're also extra, extra broke. Right. <laughs> because you're spending so much money to, to feed that growth. And everything that you have to buy so far in advance. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, whereas, you know, back in, you know, 2015, I had to think about, okay, how am I going to make 300 boxes of Sober Mesa a month? And now I'm at a point where it's like, okay, how am I going to make and pay for 5,000 boxes of Sober Mesa a month? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it all gets really, it gets really big. If things go as well as they have, it can get really big really quick. And with that comes an awful lot of work and an awful lot of stress and an awful lot of being broke. And it's, it's look, it's, but this is the way it always has been. I mean, look, when I was at Drew State, we were going through those phenomenal growth years. We were always on the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah. I mean, here we are, thirty million dollars in sales, almost bankrupt. Forty-five million in sales, almost bankrupt. I remember at one point we did sixty million. We're like, are we going to make payroll this week, right? Because wow. you're just having to dump so much cash 
into future tobacco and into labor and into you know more spaces, more buildings, more everything. And it's uh, it's it's a it's a it's a bit of a grind. I mean, I, I love it. On a much my smaller scale, my on, absolute life, I can't even think of doing anything. No. <laughs> on a much smaller scale, I'm I'm experiencing that trying to just get the shop open. I I can relate to it. And then I, I as you're saying this, I'm just picturing like the economy of scales. Like, okay, you know, I got to buy two boxes of this. I got to buy two boxes of this. And then when it goes up to, I got to buy 15 boxes of this, 15 boxes of this, and then. You know, hopefully I have the problem where I have to buy two, so many boxes that I'm trying to figure out how to pay for it. But at the same point, you know, again, I can. You have to have it or you can't grow the business. Right. You can't sell what you physically don't have. Right. And it's, it's so amazing. You, you have no choice. And I think that's I think that's the problem that a lot of small companies, you know, people that are in where I started. I mean, I started tiny. Right. With Cindy and me and John. And um and, you know, and we're kind of, I think we're kind of like getting to the, we're in this weird kind of shoulder period where we're bigger than most of the boutique companies at this point, but we're not quite La Florida Minicana, right? right? We're kind of in this kind of tweener room right now. And not a lot of companies are there, right? Because the truth is most small boutique companies never get there. You know what I mean? They'll have a couple, three, maybe even a five-year window where they're kind of hot and they're successful, and everybody's talking about them, and then they just kind of die, right? And they die for a wide variety of reasons. Um, some just because they don't know what they're doing. Some is because of the product quality. Some of it's because of bad branding choices and bad business strategy. And a lot of times it's also because you just can't afford to fund it, yeah. right? You have to be, you have to be so like, so bean counter that it's beyond bean counter sometimes it really is i mean i didn't take a salary out of the company for the first three years and then the third year in the fourth year i took a little like twelve thousand a year thousand a month so i could get so we could have a company health plan that i could be on you know what i mean yeah now, things are better now I'm, I'm i'm taking a i'm taking a salary home i gotta tell you right now i'm not taking as big a salary home today that i was taking when i was president of drew state well, sure. yes. okay so I mean, life was much better then with the minions and the big bucks, you know. Um, but it's uh, different, better in a different way. But I mean, so I, I think that a lot of people, when they get into it, they really don't understand how difficult it's going to be, and they also don't understand how you're going to go through these wild swings where you're going to have these great months and things are going to look cherry, and then you're going to go to a month where you're like, oh my god, let me eat a gun. What is going on here? Yeah. And at the same time, you're, you're not an island onto yourself. You're in a market that is just uber competitive, right? Yeah. I mean, every other asshole on the planet wants to make a cigar and have a brand. So, I mean, it's crazy the level of competition. I mean, most consumers don't see it or realize it, but I think if I was reading correctly, there were like over 400 new introductions last year alone. I mean, almost every year there's 275 to 350. And honestly, I'm thinking about 2022. I don't know that I could name 10 or 15 new things off the top of my head, right? And I'm in the business. This is what I do every day. So, so much of what's happening, it doesn't touch the greater nationwide conscience. But in every little store you go in, you're going to find some sort of like, what the fuck is this here? Yep. You know what I mean? How did this end? Um, well, you know what I mean. And it, it's everywhere. It's constant. And uh, you know, and, and look, and, and you'll and you'll see this with retailers. Retailers get to a point where they're just sick of seeing brokers. They don't even want to come in the door. They don't want to hear the dog and pony. It's like you only have so much shelf space. You can only stock so much. It's not your job as a retailer to be fair or just or give people chances. You know what I mean? So it's a it's an uber 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 competitive market, and you're not just getting beat down by the new little stuff, but you then also have the big players that look they're just better at this than we are. They got the marketing budgets, they got the sales teams, they got all the corporate infrastructure. Uh, they're able to provide so much extra added benefit to the retailer in the way of swag. I mean, even stupid things, uh, ziplocks and shopping bags and this and that. And, oh. You know, here I am, I'm STG. Oh, you know what? I'm going to send you a hundred of these plastic cheap cutters. 
doesn't seem like a big deal, but you know what? A hundred free cheap plastic cutters. You guy might flip them for three, four bucks a piece, or you might bundle them with, Hey, if you buy three cigars, you get one of these. All these things are very helpful. And that's something that, you know, the little guy can in no way provide the retailer, right? He, he, he doesn't have the capacity to do it in any way whatsoever. And then the other problem too is when it's the big brand, whatever it be, Macanudo, Partagas, CAO, Acid, these are Rocky Patel, these are in the conscience of the consumer, right? Whereas when you have a brand like Dunbarton, now it's getting better, but when you have a brand like Dunbarton, it's a hand sell. You have to actually explain to the customer why you should buy this instead of that, right. okay? And on top of it, you don't only have to explain them that, but you also got to typically say, and yeah, it costs a little bit more too, right? So it's, 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 it's always been tough. This is not new. And I, think that, and I think that most people that get into our business, they really have no idea of what business they're getting into. And it makes it, it turns out to be a real challenge where me having being an exec at JR and then me being president of Drew Estate and blah, blah, blah. I kind of knew how sucky the the landscape was and I kind of have a little bit of a leg up. But even still, man, you got to grind, 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 grind. That's, you got to, you have no choice. So we asked you like your passion side of things and I mean, definitely, you know, kind of went into it deep there. That's, it's It's amazing how terrible something you enjoy can be right uh, like you said fishing you have a bad fishing trip it sucks if you have a good fishing trip it's great um but i wanted to bounce that to dave too because i mean you, you're not new to this industry i mean do you still have your passion and joy in the cigar world do you still you know i, I got it? it i got it back you got it back kara kara helped a lot with that when we first met she said it seems like you've just lost your passion for it and that was probably after year 14 and that was when, you know, what Steve was talking about there, like the analogy between, you know, the manufacturers and everyone's like, well, that's great. And this is, you know, from a retailer's perspective, I don't know how many people, uh, Sam is one of the few exceptions. No, I'm not saying because he's here, but he's an exceptionally bright guy. And when he came to work for me, he was up front about it. And he said, I'm doing this because I'm opening my own shop. Over 17 years, I can't tell you how many people came to the shop. like, you know what? This is a great gig. I think I'm going to open a cigar shop. And they're looking at it, it's like, all you fucking do is sit around, smoke cigars, drink scotch, and watch TV. This is great. I can do that. And it's like, yeah. Like you were talking about, Steve, you know, all the, the back office stuff that you have to deal with, there's a lot. Well, you know that. You know, I'm preaching the choir. There's a hell of a lot more that goes it's, it's involved. So much, it's so much of what your business is, is inventory control, cash flow management. Right. You know what I mean? These are, these are look, I often say, for, first off, that was really smart for him to do that. Like one of the things I always tell people that are interested in opening a cigar store is go get a job in a cigar store for a year. Right. Okay. Work as a clerk and see what the customers like, see what they like, see how they interact, see what works, see what doesn't work. Because you know, and the guy, and always invariably what they'll say to me, well, I won't make enough money. And I said, dude, you have no clue. If you open a cigar <laughs> store, you're going to make less than what you're going to make being a clerk. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you have to prepare to make no jack because that's the way this is going to be. And on top of that, think of how much money you're going to save that you had the education of being somewhere for a year or two right. and actually see for yourself what the daily in out is really like rather than the perception of you as a consumer. It's, it's invaluable. And you learn the brands. That's the best way to go. And you learn the brands that you need to come in, you know, out of the game, yeah. basically. You know, you can't just carry general alternates, you know. You've got to carry. Well, you know, I mean, holy shit. yeah, but you, but you also have to carry. But you also have to carry some of that too. Oh, absolutely. It's, yes, right. It's, it's finding the right balance. I always another thing I always tell retailers is they should be at a point when they're three years in that ninety percent of their humidor should be stocked based on the numbers and limit yourself to ten percent low. Okay, because everything being on your shelf that you personally love is a disaster for most retailers. Right. It really, really is. Because you have to serve a much wider client base that is going to have a wide variety of likes and dislikes that are going to be at entirely different price points as to what they consider the sweet spot. And you really, it's your responsibility to try to serve all those needs as best you can. 
Now, you can run a model where you have a store that only does super, super this, or super cheap, or super high, or whatever, but that that requires a lot, you know? When you're going to be a Jeff Borshowitz of the world and have a Corona cigar, well, you're looking at multi-million dollar bar build-outs, right? You're looking at 30K a month rent right. is what you're talking about there. You're talking about a staff of probably close to 80 to 100 people to staff those three stores. Um, but you notice... Corona Cigars, the online company, okay, maybe they won't have the $8 cigar or the $6 cigar in the store on the shelf where the fancy booze is, but you can still, he still sells all those same cigars, right? Because that's the market, right? And I think that's one of the things that, I think it's one of the things that's really important for retailers to grasp is really understanding who their customer is. Well, we're going to go ahead and give Steve an opportunity to take a few pops off of that cigar, and we're going to get into the Cigar News of the Week. It's time for the Cigar News, brought to you by Tom's Penworks. As a cigar smoker, you appreciate luxury. And as a premium cigar smoker, you appreciate handmade craftsmanship. And as a customer of Tom's Penworks, you will appreciate the selection of custom-made, limited production items that you can show off to your friends. From handmade pens, pencils, bottle openers, cigar cases, and now custom rings, Tom will create something special for you or your loved one. Find them on the web at etsy.com slash shop slash Tom's Penworks. And as always, you can find the link in the description for this episode. Try to hit this as fast as we can so we can get back to Steve. Aging Room Cigars, a brand owned by Raffio and Adele's Boutique One Cigars, is releasing a new line called the Aging Room Nicaraguan Sonata. A new line will make its debut at TPE 23 in Las Vegas, another AJ Fernandez team up. The Sonata features 100% Nicaraguan tobaccos and is box pressed. It'll be offered in six sizes each, uh, presented in 20 count boxes, with the exception of the Impromptu, which is a figurado, and it will be in 10 count boxes. Uh, California Assemblyman Damon Connolly has introduced a bill, AB 935, that will prohibit anyone from purchasing a tobacco product who was born on or after January 1st, 2007. This is an important one. Essentially, it would implement total prohibition of tobacco products for future generations. The Premium Cigar Association has launched a call to action against the bill, and uh, CigarAction.org is an important tool for all cigar lovers and consumer freedom ag- advocates. Uh, Glenn Loop, Director of State Affairs at the Premium Cigar Association, has said, uh, by signing up for CigarAction.org, you can make your voice heard and help the fight. I am going to include links to CigarAction.org and CigarRights.org in the description of this episode so you guys can uh, chime in and make your voices heard on that one. Uh, it's a slippery slope. We all know California is a little bit crazy, but that shit spreads. So let's get on top. already did that. Indeed. United Cigars and All Saints Cigars are teaming up for St. Patrick's Day Firecracker. The St. Patrick's Day Firecracker is a barber pole featuring Oscuro and Candela wrappers. The cigar is a five and a third by 50. It features a long fuse stemming from the cap. It is still to be seen if Mickey Pegg will follow the rules for the firecracker line better than Steve Saka did. At the end of the month, JRE Tobacco Company will release a Candela offering under its Aladino brand, appropriately called the Aladino Candela. It features a Candela wrapper over Honduran binders and fillers. The Honduran tobacco comes from the JRE Tobacco Farm and includes the Aroa's signature Corojo tobacco. The cigars will come in one size, a 5x50 five, uh, five Rebuso, and each will be available in 20 count boxes. Uh, also in St. Patty's news, the Alec Bradley Filthy Hooligan and Shamrock 2023 releases are heading to retailers. And one more is heading to the retailers. The 2023 uh, Totus Los Dias is coming out, which, Dave, I believe you're getting and I'm getting. I believe so. so. You'll Can get... you check that for me, Steve? I, I think we're on the list as we get that. Just throwing it out there. I have to go look on Facebook. I, I posted the list they gave me. Actually, you know what? That's where I saw it. I, I was on the list on Facebook. I was like, oh, good, good. I, yeah. I didn't forget those. Yeah. So I have uh, one more serious question for Steve before we start rolling in the stuff that's a little bit more laid back. And uh, as you know, Sam is opening just to tip cigars, hopefully within the next couple of months here. So I wanted to ask from your perspective, what do you think is the biggest mistake that retailers make or the best advice that you can give, particularly as this is your opportunity to have input before he starts making your life harder? I will take it. <laughs> wow. You know, I, I touched on it a bit, right? He already started by working in a store, which was very smart to do. Um, and I think he has a pretty good comprehension of he's probably not going to make a lot of jack at the beginning. Yeah. He's lucky enough he can eke out enough to pay for food and the rent or the mortgage, but 
there ain't going to be a whole lot of there ain't going to be a whole lot of caviar and champagne dreams. Going it's called on. a sugar mama, sir, and I highly recommend you get one. Um, <laughs> I think that you know one of the biggest mistakes I see current retailers make that too often lately is they don't really think about the fact that square footage costs money. Yeah, and it's really nice to have these lounges, but to have a big lounge, you need to have a big humidor to support it. I really don't like it when I go into a store and I see that, you know, 80% of the space is, you know, 70, 80% is dedicated towards something that doesn't actually earn you money. I mean, the traditional retailer, they judge, you know, they judge what does a square foot equal in dollars. And that's a very common retail thing. And cigar stores by their nature are already at a very big deficit because how many retail stores do we go into which aren't dedicated with product that you can buy everywhere? You know what I mean? I mean, Apple is probably one of the few sparser locations, right? The super high-end luxuries, right? Right. The Armani's of the world and the Chanel's. Well, guess what? The cigar business isn't that, no matter how many <laughs> times they try to make you think it isn't cigar aficionado. That's just not the reality. So I think that's a really big thing is to, Think about how much of this space, even if you don't use it in the beginning as retailable, as retail space, that you have a plan that, okay, I can make this retailable because you have to have a certain amount to sell to support the store. You're making him so yeah, happy right yeah. now, Steve. If that's the thing that you pointed out, uh, I'm going to thank Mr. Dave Puskovich as one of the bigger inputs that told me the same thing. And uh, I had my original design. My humidor was, I believe it was 12 by 16 or 14 by 16. And, uh, and you know plenty of shop around it um so now the humidor is the same size but we actually build it it's now over over a third the of the square footage that i have will be eventually humidor design the whole thing to be expandable so eventually i can go up to a 24 by 16 but i don't have to fork all that money out at the beginning to stock that you know at the beginning so definitely made my day with that i was sitting here trying to actually to hold my smile so the other the other big piece of advice i like to give people are considered or they're really early on is don't buy any deals. Just don't do it. They're not your friend. Okay. You, the only way deals make sense for you as a retailer is if you know how many turns you do on a particular product in a given amount of time. Right. Yes, so man. when you have Acid Cuba Cuba and you have a store like Dave has and he sees how many he sells every year, it then becomes a mathematical question. Okay. If I buy heavy and I get this 20 points, how long am I going to have to carry that inventory before it actually turns out? So it's always better to just pay full wholesale, not take the deals, particularly on the new stuff. The new stuff is just a total fucking gamble. Okay. And just see what happens because way too many people get stuck with a lot of inventory that doesn't turn. And honestly, they spent a lot of money to have those 20 points. I mean, one of the things I always ask every time I go in a shop, I go, hey, why don't you show me your most expensive cigar? You know, take me to a unicorn or it'll take me to a, a Cohiba Spectre or show me a Davidoff Puro or if they're one of those Davidoff shops. And every time I say, no, dude, you're wrong. It's this box over here. Because there's a box of a brand that has been dead for over seven years and it's still sucking up space on your shelf and you're not getting the money you put into it. You should have cut your loss way back when. Get dead shit out of your shop. If it ain't, give it a reasonable amount of time. Give it a chance. But if it doesn't work, don't hold on to, oh, I lose this margin. No, what you want to do is you want to recapture your cash so that you can then take your cash and bet on something else. Because keeping those slow-moving dogs there, they're never not going to be dogs. They're only going to get even uglier as the years go by. But every year they're there, they are literally costing you money every single time. So I think it's really good to avoid the deals, don't go deep, figure out what works in your shop and what doesn't work in your shop. And then at some point in your life and you have the extra cash, you'll go, you know what? Yeah, I, I call an awful lot of those goddamn Umba gogs. You know, it's worth it to me to take on 80 bundles if I'm going to get, you know, five bundles for your 10 bundles. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then, it becomes a, then it becomes a decision. Right. Not, no, I dig it. Not dreaming of, oh, I'm going to make an extra 20 points. Because rarely you do. So that was uh, Corey's last serious question. I got my last serious question, which is a combination. So the California bill that we just brought up and yeah. um, and then the 
uh, thing going on in Connecticut. Uh, Seth Jones, one of our guys, just commented on it, uh, passing that bill to a lost sale of liquor in the same location. Uh, what are your thoughts on those two deals? Because I know you're a New Englander. You're not that well, far. Well, first off, I, I don't understand why liquor and tobacco aren't always in the same location. They are for me. Right. So uh, I, I don't really <laughs> – I mean, it, it just makes sense. I mean, if there's any place to talk about not having youth access, it's bars, right? So it's like the perfect location. Um, so I hope that they're ultimately successful in Connecticut and in other places around the country. The California thing, look, the, this congressman, state congressman who put it up, he's a new state congressman. He's just trying to make a splash, okay? It's probably not going to pass on this go around in California. But the problem is it's a very insidious and they're actually quite smart band, if you think about it. Because essentially what you're saying with his proposal, that anyone who's 15 today, who shouldn't be smoking anyway, they will never be allowed to smoke anything. They chew a little pouch of snooze, whatever, nothing. So you're really banning stuff that doesn't affect the current population who votes. Right. Right. So it's a really easy ban as a, as a person to be like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Cause it doesn't affect me. Now the problem is just from a philosophical political point of view, this is just absolutely one of the greatest sins possible that you actually are passing laws for constituents who a not do not impact you but B, they don't even have, they're not actually constituents yet. Right. They don't even get to have a voice in the discussion. And so for me, I, I just find it just an absolute aberration of everything that I consider to be little D democratic. Um, the problem is, it is such an ingenious and insidious idea. This has become law in New Zealand and in Australia. Yeah. Okay. And this proposal is going to appear every single place. Because it's just too good not to do it. And they understand that they're probably not going to get a lot of people that are philosophically minded about this. They're like, okay, what do I care? Yeah. Uh, that's. But the other side of that coin is California. And don't get me wrong, I am not anti-reefer. But they're going to blow the doors open on reefer. Right. And they're going to make cigars illegal. Yeah. It's like, there's just no common sense involved in this whatsoever. No, not to mention the fact that if a if a big party of fifteen year olds showed up at the courthouse to uh, to have their say, that would just fight for their argument, right? right. Like, go and look at these kids want to smoke. That's not good. Like that. Yeah. Then no matter what, it just fuels the fire. Yeah. The the only defense to it is they can vote at eighteen, and smoking laws are twenty one anyways. You guys got three years if you really want to get into cigars. You got three years to fight it. That's the next one. That that's all. Anybody also... born after this date can't vote. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start using that born after as a. But as you said, insidious way of getting your way. It's it's terrible. All right. As promised, the serious questions are gone. Yes, that is it. On to the others. I got a bad feeling about this. Uh, So something that I really enjoy asking guests on this show. (laughs) I knew it was coming. If you had to or had the option, if you could fight anybody else in the cigar industry, who would it be and why? It doesn't have to be somebody you dislike. It might just be somebody... That, that you love that drives you nuts. It might be somebody you just like to see how you stack up against, but who would you throw down with? Like I admit, never thought of this. So I can only think of the people that I've wanted to beat up. So, uh, yeah, I'd want Rocky Patel. Oh, <laughs> damn. Going you're for RP. You, that, well, you're that only that boy a punching bag. That would be the last <laughs> choice for me because I know he could sue me afterward, right? Like, that guy knows his <laughs> Oh, and he'll have the money to win, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're talking just a straight up. Here's a ring. You two go at it. And at the end, you walk. And that, away. and that would be a real. That would be a real test of look. Rocky's fit. He's athletic. He's in shape. And me, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just simply pounds, right? <laughs> so it's just kind of that question of does the uh, does the guy with all the good cardio and nice looks uh, can is he the one that is the better of the fat slob? Right, that just has all the power. So it would be, be an interesting. It would be an interesting competition. I think. I, I, I don't know. I will not say that I would win it. I would have my money on you though, simply because of cold weather resistance. People <laughs> who grew up in in cold weather areas, we could take a hit a little bit better. <laughs> I, I think there's a fun way to market this, and when you open the shop, first oh. big promotion: Rocky <laughs> Patel versus Steve Saka. 
and uh, you know, trust we, me, we Rocky Patel does not want to come down to my level. That will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I and, and, and as his PR person, I would advise him against it. Yes, it stay it, away. It, it doesn't help his brand in any way associating with someone like me. It's so. like Rocky, you can't lose this one, but at the same time, you can't win either. Did you, <laughs> do you guys remember the show on MTV back in the day, uh, Celebrity Death Fight? Celebrity Death Fight. Yeah, I, I don't know why when you started talking about you and Rocky going at it, I just like I started picturing you guys in claymation. It, it, it's so funny you bring that up because that's how I often would describe my time at Drew State <laughs> when we would have meetings. It would be like one of those celebrity death matches in claymation yeah. from fucking MTV, man. Dude, I, I'm totally picturing you you morphing into the soccer squash at the very end of the death match and just like going for a ground and pound. And then, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to avoid a lot of the comments for the Rocky side of things because I feel like turn into a rock. Not, yeah, no, just, you just be banging against a rock. <laughs> All of a sudden, Dwayne The Rock Johnson comes in from the crowd and tags in. Oh, wow. oh! Oh, that's a good one. He yeah. can afford it, right? Yeah, that's that's right. the problem. He can pay that. Yeah, why not? Right. Oh, instead of that bottle of champagne I'm going to have on Tuesday, oh, let's get the rocket here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now this is the cigar. Now, yeah. This, this is, so this is what our show actually is. No. Um. We we got we but we covered actual like subjects there for yeah, a good little, little split. Yeah. So my next question scares me a little bit because we may have already covered it. Um. What is the question that you get asked that you hate? Whether it's by consumers, Let's whether it's media, the question I hate is what's next. Uh, uh, so everybody, it's what everybody on my side of the fence hates. Yeah, because you literally, you're at an event, you're literally debuting that product that you just spent two plus years working on, and as a consumer is buying that, he's literally asking, "Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. When's it coming out?" <laughs> right? It's like, oh my! God. And look, they. Don't, and they mean it in the most pop, right? Yeah. They love your product. They look forward to what you make. You know what I mean? It, it, they're being they're being polite, right? They're showing their support, but you have no idea what a little tweak it is in all of us because it's so exhausting. There's there's never a chance to kind of rest on your laurels. It's it's one of the greatest things that's happened to our industry. Or greatest is not the right way to put it, but significant sea change. I mean. There used to be an environment that bred the concept of consistent, quality, well-constructed cigars under a brand that could grow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now it's been so replaced with everybody wants what's new, what's next, what's this. And, and look, and we as manufacturers, we're forced to respond to it. And you as retailers are forced to respond to it. Yep. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it makes it so hard to be in the cigar business today for the small guys is you're on a constant hammer, hamster wheel of churning and burning. And look, it's one of the things that I have really, really thought very long and hard about. And I, and you notice that I actually just keep the same brand and just figure out how to grow them. And look, I know they're not as sexy in year two and three and four and five, but if they're quality and they've managed to hold their own while they were there, they're now starting to find a much wider consumer base that doesn't know who Steve Saka is, doesn't know who Dunbarton is, is never going to give a fuck about either anyways. They just know that, wow, I like this cigar. Yep. You know, smells great, tastes great, boom, boom, boom. And then you go... Hey, you know, hey, hey Sam, well, who else makes this uh, this brand? What else does that guy make, right? Yeah. And then you point him to something else. And, and, that, and that's how, but it's so hard to make it that long. I can tell you that most of the Dunbarton retailers who have started with us in the last three years had a much more pleasant experience than some like Dave had being one of the earliest adopters, sure. okay? Because these stores have, they're just, they're just doing killer, killer, killer with it. And one of the things that worked out really well for us is we were never the heavy push company. I mean, look, we try to sell stuff. Don't, don't get me wrong, but we're really the company that really tries to, we're, we're not a pushy, pushy sales company. And I think Dave will tell you that. I mean, we're just not. No. And when so things true. didn't go well for a retailer, we would always buy the stock back at the price they paid for it. And that's a very rare thing in our business for someone to say, Oh Yeah. I'll pay you back $6,000, you know, here, send it here. 
Um, but we, we've always had that policy because if it doesn't turn, I don't make money on it. Right. Selling right. to the retailer once or twice is not the goal. The goal is to sell to this retailer today and next year he becomes a $4,000 account and then he becomes a $6,000 account, then he becomes a 10000 and becomes a twenty. And that that's, you know, it's a long-term relationship. Other than those hot one hit wonders that everybody occasionally hits. Right. Um, and, uh, by doing that policy, we had a lot of those accounts that did not do well with us in the early first couple of three years that now are doing gangbuster business with us. Right. Um, and it's not that the cigars have changed, but the brand is more widely known. You see more of it on social media, right? It's, you know, it's getting recommended in more cigar stores and that is helping that growth get fueled. But yeah, man, that that's what's next question. That that's that's always such a tough swallow. So it gonna, really is. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the comments real quick. Dan Newman said uh in that fight, Rocky has the edge, tongue in cheek. Uh that's oh, a good comment. Oh, see what you did there. <laughs> it's pretty good. I, I like it, Dan. Uh Ryan I said that right. Uh, Rocky is mint too. <laughs> uh Ryan Seneca said, if he ever meets uh, meets you, sir, he cannot wait to ask you what's next, just to be a dick. And yeah. Seth Jones said, if you hate that question, stop teasing us with little drops. Like, can't wait to introduce the Papa Saka. <laughs> true. He, he's absolutely right, right? It's a, it, 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 it's a damned if you do and damned right. if you don't, right? It's, it's like question. being that hot celebrity you know, model in the movies complaining about all the Instagram mail she gets, right? I mean, it's it's kind of the way it works. But yeah. So that, awesome. and the other thing too is, look, I, I like to tease. I do. But, <laughs> we everything that I, but, but everything that I tease, I ultimately deliver also, right? All right. There's never, there's, 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 there's rarely a false tease. I think the only, I've had a few swag projects that have been false teases just because I abandoned ship, you know, when I should have sometimes. But, I'll tell you what, I mean, that... That hot dog toaster is phenomenal. <laughs> there you go. I would not plug that in. I think we got them for eight bucks off. I, I, uh, I didn't plug it in. But people, people love looking at it. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that thing is a bomb waiting to go off. <laughs> so, so one of your posts, uh, not too far, too long back, which actually is what made me decide that this was what we were going to smoke tonight. Um, tell, tell us the story of the Doombagog, because I read the post in its entirety. Yeah. So basically, there's a. I love the freshwater. I love the fish, but mostly inshore technical light line freshwater style fishing, and um, you know bass, sports species. And um, there's a lake here in New Hampshire called Omagog. It's just gorgeous. It's literally a. In fact, they say it's one of the great wilderness lakes in the country because ninety percent of its shoreline is in conservatory. I feel like you're taking this like a serious question. And I think um, you misheard me. Not about the Umbagog, the Doombagog. Yeah. The Doombagog. The cigar that was months old that you found in your car after digging oh, the Oh, God, sticks. yeah, the Doombagog. I forgot. <laughs> I read so much stupid That's shit. That's why I was like, I, I, I'm going to cut you off, but I'm going to save you from the same old. Yeah, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. I don't want you um, to have to repeat it. We told you we weren't going to do that to you. Yeah. I, you know, Umbagogs are amazingly resilient. They really are. I mean, you can... And you can smoke it in the rain. You can smoke it while you're going 35, 40 miles an hour on a bike. I mean, even even at 50 and 60, sometimes they hold up. While you're in a boat, you know, it's really, it rarely ever cracks. You know, you can literally drop it on the pavement, pick it up, do it three times. I actually had one that I was snow blowing, and it fell out of my mouth, and it went through the snow blower. <laughs> Obviously, the impeller didn't hit it, and it went in with the snow and shot 20 feet over. I picked it up and lit it and it was perfectly fucking fine. I mean, it's just such an unbelievably durable cigar. Oh. And uh, so I, I found one in my truck that I don't know how long it had been there, but it was all shriveled and hard as a rock. And like, I mean, it's like literally the worst condition. It was probably in there since like last spring. So it went spring, summer, fall. Now it's, you know, eight degrees out. So, uh, I'm like, oh, well, let's see how well it holds up. And the answer is it didn't. What kind it's of truck? <laughs> it was pretty sad. It was a sad cigar. What kind of truck does Steve suck at? Oh, there you go. Um, I have a, I have a 2012 F-150 Raptor with the V8. There you go. I knew it was going to be so, got, so uh, It's got about 200 and 
225, 230,000 miles on it. It's such a fun truck, though. Especially like when they were new and all trucks weren't 600 horsepower. Like that thing felt like yeah. bad out of hell when they came out. It really did. Because you know what? I think why, the reason why was because having been someone that's driven trucks my whole life, I grew up in Texas, um, trucks have a feel to them when they drive, right? And they certainly don't press you back in your seat when you step on the accelerator. <laughs> And they certainly don't handle curves the way that Raptor does. No, that's now, nice. Cool. It's really, it was a great truck. And it's one of the reasons I held on to it too, is because it's always a great truck, but I just don't want the V6 piece of shit that they've been slinging yeah. in the meantime. I've been waiting for this next release. And I'll probably buy one of these new ones um, because look, 225, 230, it's not as reliable as it yeah. used to be. Um, but I want to go look at it in person. And I also want the uh, the nonsense over sticker crap to go away. I'm yeah. not I'm not gonna pay the over sticker. I can I can drive my uh, 10, 12 year old one. You know what I mean? It's just fine. Speaking of things that have been banned in California, you'd probably get arrested for driving that thing over. Yeah, it's there. too old now. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what six miles a gallon, something like that? Um, it gets thirteen point two to thirteen point eight. There you go. That's actually not too my bad. Mine, I have a 90 F250, and that 460, I did a little bit of modification, but I, I hold a good 12, 13 mile a gallon in that thing. Which is hard in Pennsylvania. We yeah. have a lot of hills. So I I, I got to say it's great. Now, you put the trailer behind it, and it goes to feet yeah. feet per mile, but <laughs> or feet per gallon, but it that's about it. Well, so uh, on the insidious idea bandwagon that we were kind of broaching earlier, ah. I wonder if I might be able to solve your problems with that what's new and what's coming. Um, I'm probably not the first guy to think about this, and somebody's probably implemented it, but why not just do a limited release and then every year put the same cigar out with a different band and name on it? <laughs> <laughs> then the work's done. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, well, let me say this. Hey, that's very common. Not yeah. for the limited, but... There are a lot of brands in the marketplace that are the exact same cigars with just different bands yeah. on them. And, you know, so, and it's amazing because brand has a real huge impact. The same cigar, but packaged and priced differently ends up being really successful where the one before it didn't. It, it's hard to sometimes tell what's going to ultimately resonate with the consumer. Um, one of the things for me though, is part of, part of the, kind of the promise I make is that I'm going to actually do my best to give you better shit. Right. And so kind of an obligation to, to if I'm going to make something exclusive, that it be something exclusive. Um, the problem with that is I run out of places to go and, uh, it's, uh, and it makes me kind of push a little bit into edges sometimes that I don't want to be in like with frog juice, for example. Frog juice is a cigar that I don't know whether I love it or I hate that one. <laughs> I smoke it sometimes like, wow, this is genius. I smoke it other times and go, what were you fucking thinking anymore? <laughs> you know, it's just something about that blend that just drives me crazy. Uh, so you get kind of pushed out somewhere in these outer ranges. And you also, I think, have the responsibility of, look, many people get to points where they're hot and they do super well, right? And they have these crazy times. I have pretty much consecutively for the last four years or so done a, a bunch of exclusives and they all sell out pretty much instantaneously. I mean, one of them has got the point that it's over 2000 boxes we make, you know, to handle the load. So, um, it's, uh, you just, you feel an obligation that if you have these customers that are buying that stuff blindly on good faith, because of your previous work, there's an obligation to put something in there that you really think is worthwhile. And, 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 that, and that's, that, that can be a challenge. You know, so I'm, I'm very simplistic in my packaging, not, not as simple as Pete at the Tuahe with his, you know, Cuban ass style branding, but if you look at other than sober Mesa, Everything is not a whole lot of heavy design work because that's definitely not my forte. At least you differentiate. That's yes. what I hate is when you can't tell the difference. You hear about the cigar, you walk in, you have no idea the difference between this one and that one. Yeah. There's two There's two totally, you know, and, and this is something that Sam and Dave can comment on, but there's, there's, there's kind of two basic approaches to branding in our industry. You either go with your one name and you have a cohesive look 
which makes it easier to become recognized sooner. It also gives you a much bigger footprint in the store, but also in the store, maybe not as big because they don't want everything in the shop to look the same either, right? But it looks like a really nice footprint because it's also cohesive. When things are going well, great. But when things are going bad, it hurts everything. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So when you have the individual branding, it's much harder because now you got to teach consumers about Mickey Reed and Silver Mason, fucking to Comper Miso, and on and on and on. And it's a much more difficult thing to do than just, oh, it's Steve Sock, right? All I and, ask for uh, is a secondary band. <laughs> right. Just, you know, well, tell me the name. So the right? Time out. Just wait till we get to the end of the year. It will... I have solved this problem for my retailers, okay? But I like the separate brands because Brulee does not rely on Umbagog, and Umbagog doesn't rely on Syncompromise. So they are primarily islands onto themselves, and each of those children have the right to go out there and do what they can do. You know what I mean? It's one of the things, too, from a philosophical point of view. It's one of the reasons why I don't make lower-quality cigars ever. I try to try to make the very best cigar in the genre possible, right? Not that I smoke a lot of mild Connecticut shade cigars, but I occasionally do. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make a mild Connecticut shade cigar. I'm going to try to make the absolute best one I possibly can. And I try to keep the brands separated in a way for different consumers. You know what I mean? You know, the guy that likes to smoke on the, on the ritzier end, but likes it a bit smoother, Sin Compromiso is a nice fit for that guy, right? The younger guy that doesn't smoke Padron, doesn't feel the affinity for Padron, well, here's something that's an alternative to offer that guy. Whereas, you know, Mickey Rita's are for the guys that smoke uh, cigars like, you know, Tabernacle and Liga Pravada and those style of cigars. So I try to make the branding different, but I also try to make sure that the profile of the cigars that are within the brand are unique unto themselves. So speaking of the Tabernacle, um, I, I don't think it's too big of a jump to say that you and, and Nick – enjoyed a lot of success together and made an excellent team and also both left the Drew estate in a similar time frame. Uh, right. Do you stay in contact with Nick? Do you, do you, is there a possibility we may ever see a collaboration between the two of you guys again? Look, I, I'm, I'm old enough to know never say ever, right? Um, I'm not a big believer in collaborations, to be honest with you. I, I think they get a lot of press and a lot of interest from consumers because it's always that question of, oh, I love him and oh, I love her. And if they were together, they have a baby. You know, how beautiful, you know what I mean? So the illusion with consumers are, oh, I really love what Robert Caldwell does and I really love what, well, I'm trying to think of somebody off the top of my head, let's just use Nick does. If they get together, what a magical cigar they're going to create, right? I, I just don't think that's true. I I, I actually don't. I think that the reason why a consumer chooses to smoke a particular brand that where the person that's the brand is the product, right? Nick directly controls what's made for him. He's directly involved in tobacco. I do the same. You know what I mean? There are some of us that are like that. Um, and I'm losing my train of thought. I need more booze. But I, I what the hell were we talking about? <laughs> Take a minute. Uh, basically, or... all I was saying was you talk to Nick. Is there, a, oh, is there a potential for so something? Getting back, yeah. So what I'm saying to you is it's that individual creativity of that blender that makes those cigars appealing. And you like this guy over here, let him be that guy over there, and he'll do his best work. Let this guy over there. Very rare when you put these two things together does it end up being actually better. And it very rarely ends up exceeding the initial sum of the of the two individuals in the equation, right? I, I just don't like them. I, I, I just so it's it's hard to imagine that I would. You know, it, it's funny you say that because you got me thinking about like, okay, yeah, on that side of things, it's that way, but it's the complete opposite, I, in my opinion. It when you like if you source tobacco from one one source and then you get it from another source, you know, now all of a sudden when you put them together, that collaboration is beautiful. But I think what you said is spot on, like it all has to come to a head and somebody has to be the decision maker at the top and to try and negotiate it between two people. That would be a decision. Guess what? And that person that gets that pole position, he's going to be making compromises in order for it to work. Right. The pole position is like, this is the difference, right? Right. It's just one person is a little bit more dominant in the conversation. It's not that they're not equal. Yeah. That, so, that, that's crazy. So it's just, to me, in the end, from just a cigar point of view, 
it just seems like you're going to have to make a concession on whatever there is. And for me, I, I just, I think over the last, you know, three and a half decades, I can't think of any collaborations off the top of my head that had any sustainability or were good enough that I wanted to taste it after the first few samples. Uh, Except for AJ maybe, Fernandez and everybody. And everybody's. And yeah, everybody. but that's, that's a different thing. That's all AJ Fernandez. Right. With their brand slapped right. on top, right? So if you like AJ Fernandez, you're going to like the whatever STG stuck on the box or whatever Altidus sticks on the box or whatever whoever sticks on the box. You're going to be happy. You just need to find the one that works the best for you. But, I mean, that's not the same as two people that actually are involved in the cigars, you know. Yeah, when you're trying you to combine two artists. And, you, know, you know, I'm trying to think. Um, gosh, darn. Somebody, somebody get this guy some booze. Somebody else. Somebody else that's really a good guy. You know, we have to make a cigar together. I just, I just don't think it makes a better cigar. I mean, can you guys think of any brands, that, these collaborations that have ever been successful? I was thinking Leaning House and uh, uh, CLE. <laughs> I mean, that was a beautiful that's collaboration. That's the same, though. I'm yeah. just being a smartass, that's all. Well, <laughs> that's a smart well thing, yeah, that, that's a smartass yeah. comment, obviously. I mean, because it's totally controlled by CLE. You know, I just, I'm just working with them because of the relationship I have with them. Right. It's not like I'm sitting there, it's like, no, no, I want more of a heroin this. You know, I mean, there's none of that yeah. going on. So, yeah, that was just. Yeah, that, just, that was just. Fucking being, around. I was being a dick. Yeah, yeah. So we got a little window into Steve outside of the cigar industry with the fact that you're an outdoorsman. I, I'm curious, is there any other nerdy parts of your life? Do you uh, attend Star Trek conventions or are you uh, super God, into not, uh, Marvel no. movies or, you know, what when you're stepping away from this and you can't get to Lake Umbagad? I like, uh, look, I like, I don't know why, I've always liked any sort of dystopian or apocalyptic anything. Mm book movie um i don't know why i just seem to those are just like popcorn to me are you watching the last of us huh are you watching the last of us i'm not watching it because i don't have hbo max i'm trying to decide if it's worth spending the uh 19 dollars or nine dollars a month for it so for those of you guys thinking that you're that You're steve saka's you know got money piled up to the top of the ceiling apparently uh, not so much. I will tell you, if you get AT and T cell phone service, you can get that uh, included free, free with that. Uh, but it, I do highly recommend it. It's a great series. Yeah, six hundred dollars to save a hundred bucks. Right? I'm not going with that. <laughs> <laughs> if you buy twenty thousand dollars worth of cigars, I'm going to give you a fifteen percent discount. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It, uh... But Dave, can you can you think of any brands over all those years that? I, I, I mean, you had what you had Christian and you know, and uh, Lido do that face off project. That was probably one of the more successful ones, but that was also very short lived. Yeah. It didn't like generate any real long term cash. Yeah, or I, I can't think of anything that was had any sustainability to it whatsoever. And yeah, anyway, it, it, like it's, said, just, it's the same thing for celebrities. Celebrities yeah. come and go in our business. Yeah. In fact, the one that Eric's working with now, Guy Fieri, right. that yeah. one might have a shot of actually working out. Because right. guy is actually really into it, right? Well, not so, only that, but that's a guy that that again, he's in the wheelhouse, right? He knows taste. Right. He's not dunking basketballs or throwing touchdowns right. for his day job. Right. Like the guy right, understands. Right. right, this is a guy who this is a guy who you can relate to, who you want to have a beer with, right? You can you Watch. can see yourself at a party with him. Do you wear your sunglasses on the back of your head? Try an uncle sandwich. <laughs> I. Don't, I I don't think it's even. I don't think it's apples to apples though, because like, when you have someone like Steve and someone like Nick, like they're used to being the the creative mind of it. They're you, you know you guys are used to being. The I will say Nick and I worked really well together because we have very similar power. Yeah, but I'm just anybody. You, you and Eric uh, Espinosa, like you know, if you guys are in the same room, you're both used to being the shot caller, and you both have a way that you're going about it. Where I think that. You know, I, I would assume that in the room with, you know, Espinosa and Fieri, if they're sitting down blending, you know, Espinosa is trying to take a back seat and probably showing him like, hey, this is what you want to look for to kind of get started and go. And then just kind of leaves him to it and helps him guide him through tobaccos. I don't think that's the same as having two head honchos. Well, the difference there, too, is like with like Steve and Nick, you got cigar guy, cigar guy. Right. With Guy and Eric, you got cigar guy and food guy who happens to be. A lover of cigars, right? So they're bringing two worlds together, yeah, and then, as opposed to like two variations of the same world. 
Yeah, and then you know you get these athletes that want to do it. That you know, no offense, like good on you, man. But you, they want to use their marketing that's built into their name, and that that's going to carry a lot of it. You know, I, a couple of those are coming to mind that like the marketing of their name is carrying it. So yeah, it's selling, and it may last. I can tell you, in the last year, I've had no. I've had about four different approaches from that kind of like next tier athlete. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yep. Great, great athlete, but. You know what I mean? Not not one of those iconic athletes, right? And so I mean, these there's there's a ton of them shopping, NBA guys. I have one from a an ex NFL quarterback, a well known, right? And I try to explain to them the brutality of how this actually pans out, and they basically pass on me because I'm just the negative Nancy. But I've just seen it, just literally over the years. The only one that had any little like chance, the Dicka one lived on because of the way that they decided to start releasing it annually yeah. instead of making it a, hey, try to buy a Dicka cigar. Because who wants to put a Dicka in their mouth? It's just a terrible name for a fucker. Cigar. Anybody that walks right? in there, just the tip. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to leave that low hanging fruit there. Uh, oh, no, no. Please do. Oh, no. We can't <laughs> around these parts. Uh, but, wow. I mean, yeah, so it's uh, I, it's just these are really tough projects, man. Uh, I mean, even when you look at some of the sponsorship or the co like some of the most successful ones over the last three decades was when CAO got the Sopranos, right? Yeah, it was a really good tie in. They yeah. smoked a lot of cigars, Sopranos, good branding that works well on a cigar, and I think that that one did well, but even the ones that do well come to their end. Yeah, what's the long time? Most, most of these, most of these kind of licensed brand kind of co deals, they don't make any money. They almost always end up being turds. Yeah. So, what's the the most frustrating one of these? Like, at, not which one, but like of the ones you've done, what's the thing that when you're sitting down with these people is your the thing you enjoy the most, and what's the thing that's your biggest pet peeve about it? Like, guy comes in, he's like, "Oh, I want a cigar that's this, 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 this." You know. I think look, it's 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 the the thing that bothers me the most is the fact that they're just so in the clouds. They're so dreaming. They just, they have no basis in what they think this is going to be as far as a, a business and the size of it and the scale of it. And uh, I mean, look, we're, we're very much like most businesses. It takes about 10 years to become an overnight success in the <laughs> business. It really does. That's about where this, the, the, the trigger gets flipped. If you can make it out of that five-year cycle brand and make it into where you're still growing in your seventh, eighth year, you're on your track of hitting that 10 mil mark. And at that 10 mil mark, things just kind of turn around a bit because your brand has a certain amount of weight, a certain amount of volume that's across the country, much more exposure, much more knowledge about it. And things can really, they can really steamroll crazy in that, in that window. Well, that, that, cuts back to something that you were talking about earlier with the struggles that you're facing now and where your financial assets are going into your company's future, right? And how some companies, you know, pitter out, they're hot and then they're gone. And I think a lot of that may have to do with the lack of knowledge of the cigar industry. They think they're doing really well. They're not putting the money into the future like they should. Essentially, they take off of the, the foot off the gas and then disappear because they're they're not understanding how much it takes to sustain that position. But it's not just a cash. One of the biggest problems is they just when you're when you're starting your first cigar company, you're just like, oh, I got this great idea for a product, blah 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 blah, and here's the brand name, yada yada yada. And then because of the way the industry works, you're forced to make a second, and then a third, then a fourth, and then a fifth. Right, and you're living on these. Hey, it sells for a year and then it's dead. But guess what? I got something new for you this year, Bob. And so, most people that get into it, they don't have any sort of logic or reason why they're doing what they're doing, why their brands are named this way, why they're packaged this way, why they're positioned this way, who are they advertising to, or not advertising, but even meant for, right? to have a really cohesive thought about what it takes to have a sustainable cigar company, right? It, it, it's not just having some brands that sell. It's much bigger than that. And I think they just lack A, the vision and understanding, and then B, 
they just they're running like bats out of hell because man they make something and it sells and then stop selling so well four or five months later and bam i gotta do something else you know what i mean and i think it's i think it's something that you really you have to think in a much larger picture and just their lack of experience they just they're just it's not that they're stupid people they're not they're just ignorant. And again, I mean, ignorant in the, in the dictionary meaning of the word. Yeah. But right? they just simply don't know. Yeah. And you can't, you don't know what questions to ask when you don't know that you don't know something. And that's a terrible position for anybody being in anything, right? That's. And, and the other thing, too, is you got to understand we're kind of in a little bit of a flexy kind of business, right? So, um, it's, and it does stem, you know, a lot from the Latin culture, which is the roots of cigars. It's a little bit more flamboyant, a little bit more flexy, a little bit more, hey, how big is mine compared to yours? So everybody, regardless of how they're really doing, is always going to say they're doing absolutely fantastic. Sales are amazing, yada, yada, yada. I mean, you see it all the time. You'll see things online and go, Man, that shit is deader than a doornail. <laughs> that kid just doesn't know it yet, right? And so, it, yeah, it's. I feel like you and I have had that conversation, Dave. Like, yeah, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Yeah, that's. I think that's the thing paper. that really uh, hamstrings. Great them. on paper, but that's not gonna work. No. Yeah, I mean, well, there are so many hidden behind the scenes factors that people don't even think about. Like you said, Steve, they're just ignorant. They're not dumb. They just don't realize because, you know, even with the Leaning House brand, it's like, all right, so what do I need to do to take the set next step? Not to compete with all you big guys, but, you know, just to. to yeah, you should do whatever you do. It's an uh, open market. Well, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. But then there's all these other, like I said, these unknown factors like, oh, shit, I have to get this license in this state to do that in that state, but no other state. And I mean, things like that is like, well, there's 2000 bucks just just because yeah. of paperwork. I opened an account, sold a guy $1,000 in cigars and. You know, that that was what he paid me, not even my markup on it. And I got to pay two grand for a license for him to have it because I sold it to him. Now I'm screwed. Exactly. exactly. Hopefully I sell him more. Yeah. And another huge mistake the small guys make is they try to go nationwide. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't do that. Work your region. If you can't drive there in your car in one day and not have to stay in a hotel, you're working too far out. Right. You, you, need, to, you need to grow it smaller organically. Just let it nurture because you cannot afford what it costs to support nationwide accounts. Right. You just simply can't. And you certainly can't give them the love and attention and dick rubbing that they all want. Ooh, it's yeah. just not possible. Right. And, and so they do. it's yeah. a really, it's, 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 and you cannot, and you cannot, you cannot market your way to success. You can't. It just, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, branding is much better when it's something that just reminds something of something they already love. Okay. than trying to convince them to get something else. You mean so, like just the tip, right? Right. Just the tip. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds certain people of what they love. He, he's running out of steam. Let's see if I rile him back up. <laughs> Has Liga Pravada become a four letter word to you? Hey. No. Um, you know, Liga Pravada, look, I'm really proud of what we did there at Drew State. I mean, we took a company that was doing really well in the infused market, but really didn't have much respectability, right? And we took that wacky tobacco company and we didn't rebrand it or repackage it or become something different. We just made a different product. And we just let our wacky selves represent this very, very traditional cigar. And I mean, it's, 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 it's a pretty big achievement. And the other thing, too, I don't think the consumers realize is that Liga Pravada really set off this crazy broadleaf high-end trend because before Liga Pravada, broadleaf cigars were cheap cigars, okay? They were bundle cigars. Those wrappers were too ugly, too rough, too coarse, too just too yuck. You know what I mean? No real cigar smoker, dignified cigar smoker is going to smoke that. And you know, we showed that you could take that wrapper and make it gorgeous and make it refined while also keeping some of those traits that made it gritty and earthy and delicious. Dirty. Right? So Dirty. And I, I just, everything about Liga Pravada for me was great. I love, I love the blend. I love the tobacco that we went down to get it. I love the branding. I think that's some of my best branding ever. Um, it's just super iconic and super clean. And I love the, I love the legacy of it. Um, 
you know. So I no for me, it, it, you have to say that when Liga was its hottest, we were selling like maybe three million dollars of that shit because we just couldn't make it. I mean, that brand has gone on to become, you know, a double digit millions of dollar brand a year. I mean, yeah, can't have nothing but love for that. No, do I want to take their? Do I want to take their cake? Absolutely, <laughs> I, want, I definitely want to take some of their cake. That's okay, and, and I think I make a lot of cigars in my portfolio. That hey, if you like the way that shit tastes, you're probably gonna like the way this shit tastes over here too. So <laughs> hey guys, I mean, yeah. Is that but, your no. hand, handwriting on the band? Was that you? Um, no, Joey did the handwriting. I mean, the I look, I'm the I was the idea guy. And Joey was the one that actually made my shit, my ideas come to reality. He's a, and Joey himself is also very talented from a branding creative. So I don't want to make it sound like Joey just did what I told him because that's not true. It was always a collaboration with Joey. And, uh, but yeah, no. I've actually yeah. sold Dunbarton cigars at your shop to people coming in asking for a Liga and you didn't have them or whatnot at the time. And I'd be like, well, if you like that, come here. And I've done exactly that. Be like, you know the guy who made that? He made this. So, 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 so try we've this. done the same thing with foundation too. Yeah. You know, of course. Like, why, know, why wouldn't you? Know? Brands, like, well, if you like Liga, here, here's yeah. two options for you. These are the, the guys thing that is, originated it. As a company, I never took the position of ever selling my brand as being an alternative to. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, from a retailer's perspective. Yeah, from our side. We've got to do what we well, do. I, retailers are going to say what retailers say. Right. But I know as a company, we never encourage that direct sales pitch head to head. Right. But look, I'd be lying to say, no, I, I want some of their money. Mm -hmm. Just the <laughs> same way as I want some of STG's money, and I want some of Altidus's money, yeah. and I want some of Davidoff's money, and Take I love you, Carlito, rockies. but I even want a little bit of your cake. I mean, you know, that's, that's I, I, want, I want to eat for the big players because right. they're the ones that have the big head. They're the ones with the mounds of food, right? I'm the guy over here with my little saucer, you know? So, yeah. Why am I going to try to take from the other guy next to me with a little sauce? I want to get that bastard on the hill. That's where <laughs> I'm heading. I, I want the guy whose crumbs are bigger than my plate. We we have no we have no cake. Just so you know, I, I think I have some oh, yeah. uh, leftover Pizza Hut cookie upstairs. You already told him I'm opening the shop, so he knows I ain't that shit. <laughs> There's no cake. Uh, I'm going to get into our last tent pole here, so that we can kind of free flow the rest of the show here. But uh, let's get into the events of the week. Don't worry, you don't have to listen to another terrible commercial. Uh, Sunday, February 19th, the PCC February Cigars and Tea Pairing Meeting at the Study at Mary's Vine. This is a cool place, Steve. It's uh, like a high-end restaurant with a cool library that has a Murphy door and to a secret uh, cigar bar, which is pretty badass. PCC will have a special meeting-only package of two cigars-associated tea pairings, and brunch will be available in the upstairs dining room starting at 11 a.m. for those looking to eat. Reservations are required for the event, but tickets will be paid for in person day of. Uh, cigars will be the Sinastro, Mr. Candela, and AJ Fernandez San Latano Requiem Habano. Tuesday, February 21st is Pipe Night in Greensburg at Dawson Maguasto Cigars. Participation is open to non launch members as long as you purchase one of the three event packages. Your purchase includes complimentary coffee, coffee and entry to the raffle. Uh, Tuesday, February 28th, you'll leave a cut and light at Butler Cigars. Deals for the event are buy five Oliva. Get one free, buy 10, get three free, and buy 20. Mix and match, get 20%, and eight free cigars plus swag. Saturday, March 4th, otherwise known as International Holidays Celebrating My Wife's Birth. Uh, it's Retro Video Game Night at the Smokestack Everything Tobacco. That's right, backed by popular demand, this Dave and Patty's production will feature vintage video games for the NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, PlayStation, N64, and more. Come relive the good old days of classic video games. And finally, Friday, March the 10th at Superior Smoke Shops in Natrona Heights, it's the annual Dave and Patty's uh, St. Patty's Party. Come ham it up with the Cigar Junkies as we do the show live from the event. We'll have food, drinks, and cigars provided, but feel free to bring your own. You do not want to miss it. As we do the show live from the event, we'll have food, drinks, and cigars provided, but feel uh -oh, free to bring somebody your own. somebody turned their volume off. <laughs> <laughs> it's I screwed it up. We see that. Yeah. I'm better now. I had so much fun watching your reaction to Tim from Cigars Daily not so much like like the content was great and all but it was you getting pissed off at your computer at the beginning <laughs> that was the most fun part of that whole video 
Dude, I threw my mouth three times. <laughs> oh, shit. Not a big tech guy then. I'm still recovering from him pretending to to be muted at the beginning of the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, because I spent like three hours today in front of this computer trying to get this goddamn program to work, and I just absolutely hate it. Uh, so I, I'm wearing plenty of deodorant, but I'm still sweating. Man. Let's just <laughs> let's just please don't let anything go wrong between now and then. Uh, fantastic. Oh, and you get to switch after this too. I do, but uh-huh. I could I could reapply, so we'll okay. be all right. <laughs> we got i got another podcast to do after this one but it'll be okay this one takes precedent we got uh, a pretty good window of time so don't don't sweat it so when i when i reached out to you i was really surprised that this is one of the dates that you had available because i was like wait isn't he leaving for tp like three days later like he's gonna do a podcast on friday before uh, i think yeah. you and i were kind of like that's we got i think we thought i had the wrong date I'm not gonna lie to you. That's the only reason I'm here. Because Steve's here. That's the only reason I'm here, bro. I'm not I'm here. Like I've invited you before. You say no. I get it. You, mm-hmm. you and everybody in our uh, chat room. Uh, well, I'm honored, Dave. Thank you. That's very kind of you. That's like the serp. Yeah, I mean, the, the king bounds of the serp. Come on, brother. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, we really do appreciate you coming on here, uh, knowing that you had no fucking clue of who we were uh, beforehand, other than the guys that put you in the who yeah. wear it better with the uh, bald head. Of the cigar <laughs> industry's uh, competition, we did do that. Or what, Sam did. What was your reaction to that, by the way? You don't remember. I don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> what are we talking about? The bald boys of cigars. I, uh, I just I put you up against like six or eight people. Just pictures of you guys from PCA and. Sounds like something that I kind of click a like on as I'm flying by in the timeline. <laughs> it, it, don't feel bad. I lost the competition. It was in my own Facebook <laughs> yeah, group that I created. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah actually it was yeah, another was podcaster fun. that won yeah indeed <laughs> oh what can you say tell dark and handsome it'll do it every time right i guess <laughs> uh, I, I i have no idea because i'm not any of those things um mm-hmm. but hey somebody's got to be short bald and ugly right <laughs> something along those lines yeah well but like i said uh if nothing else Thank you for uh, for coming on here and giving us the shot. I'm not close. I know it sounds like I'm wrapping up, like I'm not in a hurry to, but uh, I know you do have places to be, so we can get to it anytime that you have to. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, I I think it it really means a lot that basically, arguably, one of the most recognizable faces in the cigar industry is willing to come in here and spend a couple of hours goofing around with a couple of jackasses trying to get you to Junkies, say some even. silly shit that you you haven't said to somebody else before. <laughs> And you gotta remember too. I mean, that's where I began, right? I mean, the way I the way I became who I was or have become is I was just a super uber cigar geek, and I just started writing about cigars in AOL forum groups, and then migrated over to Usenet, you know, and typed up a storm there, and you know, it's just so. And then I started. A, I probably had the very first blog. I had the first cigar website the first rating site you know what i mean it was uh, called cigars nexus with uh john chonko and johnny drew were my friends not, not john drew the cigar guy different than johnny drew and, and um you know so uh, that, that's how i started so I, I always have an affinity for people that you know take their time to share something that they really enjoy uh, we appreciate it. i mean that's that's what this is it, the reality is you guys aren't going to make fucking any money doing this at all no, okay. ne- never, never. Yeah. I, I lose money. Uh, yeah, it's just not, it's just like the, the number of, I mean, we've only had one actually become, you know, Half Wheel. Right. Half Wheel is the only one that has managed to work its way to where it's actually a profitable working model, okay, that can actually support three families, uh, four families, really, right? Because, uh, so I mean, but I mean, it, it's such a large So you do it because you enjoy it, you want to share your passion. And how do you, how do you tell people like that? No. <laughs> well, absolutely. And we knew stepping into this, the demographic is too small. You know, people, people tell me all the time, well, if you pick up enough listeners, like you can really make some money. I'm like, not with this show. Yeah. Do you understand how few premium cigar smokers there are in this country? And then what percentage of those people care enough to spend hours of their week listening to content about it? It's yeah. just, it's not there. You do it because you love doing it. And when him and I started doing this a year ago, the first conversation was, if nobody listens, I want to keep doing it. 
Yeah, it, it, this is, it's our escape. It's our way to get away from wives, family, work, whatever, every Friday. It, it's two hours we spend smoking cigars, bullshit, and having a couple of drinks. We just do it with a microphone and a camera. Right. <laughs> it's definitely a reset point for me. Like, there can be stress going into doing this and prep. Not that there's a lot involved there, but, you know, I've said it before, we hit that record button and it's just like everything else goes yeah. away. And this is just like an hour and a half, two hours for us to just be ridiculous and be goofy with the people that, that want to join us. And uh, we're just really glad tonight that you're one of them. Yeah, man. But that's, one of the, that's also just one of the inherent beauties of what a cigar does. is the fact that it affords you the opportunity to actually be okay with slowing down. Yeah. It's contemplative. Yeah. It gives you a moment. Whether it gives you a moment to be more reflective or whether it gives you a moment to share more time with your wife or your best friend, it gives it a chance to actually stop and talk. And, you know, and that's the thing that makes cigars so fantastic. There's not, there's nothing else like in the world. Yeah. You know, because, you know, liquor gets you there, but you get to a point where liquor goes a totally different direction, right? Right. <laughs> you know, a cigar thing. doesn't do that. You can, you can really relax for two straight hours. That's exactly, I mean, that's why I got into it in the first place. My wife got me into cigars by handing me a cigar and saying, go outside, just sit down and do this. Don't come back. It's yeah, that, that was it. Like, go outside and smoke a cigar because I hated my job. I hated my daily grind. I was stressed out and I was a miserable prick. I went outside, smoked a cigar, come back in. It's like, oh, yeah, I just stopped for a little bit. It was like a cigar version of the Snickers commercial. Exactly. It was like, here, here talk to me when you're done with this shit. Yeah. Ryan Seneca in the chat room uh, chimes in here. Uh, by the way, Ryan uh, is a regular participant in chat rooms of uh, podcasts much bigger than ours. Uh, but he says he cares enough because he keeps hoping that Corey will break out in song only to be let down every damn week. <laughs> to which I say, I'm never going to give you up. Oh. I'm never going to let you down. So hopefully I fulfilled your hopes for the week there, Ryan Seneca. <laughs> I yeah, every time Dave, 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 Dave felt real good about this until that moment right there. His head went down. So it, it was going so well. <laughs> Steve, what, <laughs> what, until that point. what are your thoughts on cigar karaoke? What is cigar karaoke? Karaoke to cigar lounge. <laughs> it's actually to be Why fair. Would I care? To be fair. To be fair. It is one of one of the best experiences it's I've so ever fun. had in a cigar shop. But what we do is the reason I think that it's so spectacular it's is because nobody cares. The head, the head of the Pittsburgh Cigar Club, um, who we're we all have a pretty good relationship with, happens to have karaoke gear laying around. So he brings it over to Dave's shop in a private area in the back. And all of us that are already pretty much all friends get together and just pass microphones around doing karaoke and, and most of us can't sing so there's like no strangers in the group <laughs> nobody nobody has like that apprehension about singing in front of somebody that that might judge them that they don't know it's just being silly and uh goofing around it and honestly it is a hundred percent probably the most fun i've ever had at a cigar shop it, yeah it's always it's, a good time this is where the problem comes in right now the smart steve stock is oh that's a really sweet great story Right, that's what the smart Steve Stock would say. The real Steve Stock would say, "Man, it just sounds like you guys are having a circle jerk." What are you talking about? Well, I mean, you know that's I mean? a different event. <laughs> Actually, now that you say it, I think we've had more females in the shop for that, other than your concerts, for that more than anything. Right. <laughs> I can't think. Any it's other mostly time. wives that are there to drive their drunken that's husbands that's home true. at the end of the evening. I'm just defending the circle jerk comment. All right, let me go. <laughs> Let me just the little defense. But you, know, you know why it's successful? It's successful because it creates a sense of community. Yep. It gives you an environment where it's okay to have a little fun. Okay. That everything doesn't have to be red versus blue and my job sucks and the economy is going to, you know what I mean? Yep. Something gives you a little bit of, you know, that kind of just a little bit of friendly spirit with your fellow neighbor. That, that's what makes something successful. Yeah. And it'd be cigar karaoke. I mean, I know shops that do we competition Olympics on like Wednesday night. It's a big deal in the shop. They, uh, they do a lot of like side betting, you know, for how those things turn out. Um, it's, uh, but I mean, if you find something like that, it, it's really important because it builds community in your shop. 
I wrote that down, by the way. Thank he you. did. He did write uh, that Absolutely, down. like, we competition. <laughs> Keep that one in mind. I have one of those somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Barioke was good, too, but I like uh, cigar karaoke oh, yeah. a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> so many less C-section cigars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that knee brace. Um, well, you know, like Forrest Gump with long hair. <laughs> No, nope. you pick it up on the references here. You, you get the point, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just checking. Oh, yeah. It's a good time. Oh. Uh, Beat Saber Shannon says Beat Saber competition. Yeah, well, that wouldn't be a bad all right, idea. All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's go ahead and welcome the new members to the Cigar Junkies Facebook group. If you're out there listening, well, if you're out there listening on recording, you could have been here with Steve Saka. You could have had your stupid comment read on the air, dun, and you dun, could have been dun. involved in the conversation. Uh, the people that did, we got John Reeves, Jennifer Petrovic Smith, Jake Mendez, Egypt Cigars, Chris, that's probably one we're going to remove. Christopher Walmer, Juan Pablo Ventura, He's gone. Mizzle Echo Vape. He's gone. Preston Lewis Rubo, <laughs> and Alberto Medina. <laughs> and the participation trophy of the week uh, goes to He's Albert. dead. He's dead. That's <laughs> right. Dead too. I actually, I, I think you I might have way too much that. joy from that, oh, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Because half half the new guys every week end up posting Simon spam, Cow at the age age of uh, dead at the age of fifty eight or whatever yeah. it is. I've actually put a filter into the uh, into our Facebook group. Any posts that have Simon Cow in them will get rejected automatically. <laughs> I had to do that with Instagram. I removed uh, sixty five spam DM it on comments on Instagram today. I average, I spend about two to three hours every other day just deleting the spam comments for my, my posts on Instagram. It's an asshole. Then I found the rules. So now it's way easier, <laughs> but it was bad there for a while. So my final thoughts on the Umbagog, I, I said at the beginning of the show, I think this actually hits my palate better than any other DTT cigar. And that's not to say my feelings about any of the other ones. It's just, you know, everything's subjective in the cigar world. And I'm just so grateful that the one that I love the most happens to be the least expensive. Um, but it, it is gritty. It is dirty. It has uh, a lot of great characteristics to it, but it's also not, it's not like overwhelming either. Like, you know, Liga was a cigar that I wouldn't put a new guy onto because there was a lot of weight behind that cigar. This is not Depends so on unapproachable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd say my favorite from DTTs. It looks like what you're smoking. I believe you got the Saka Khan in your hand. Yeah, I'm smoking Saka Khan. Yeah, I think that's my favorite, or one of the older release Totos Los Dias. Those were pretty phenomenal. How do you feel about this one, Dave? Did Dias? What? Absolutely. Oh, the Umaga. Talk to the microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, this is actually one that we don't carry in the shop. Why? For no particular reason. Well, well I'm, I'm sure probably we'll talk in Vegas and. Uh, you all know. Yeah. Sounds like something that needs rectified. You, don't have, the, you have the Umbagog. Sure, you just trust don't. me. He does not want to be buying cigars he doesn't have in February. <laughs> uh, I, I know. But actually, what I'm looking forward to, hopefully, you'll have a spare 15 minutes and we can talk cigar politics like we did at PCA. Mm -hmm. That's so enjoyable, man. I love sitting down with you and just talking politics and not cigars necessarily. Well, cigar-related politics, obviously. Oh, poli sci major over here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. Uh, well, I do want to thank you very much, Steve, for uh, spending a couple of hours Absolutely. talking bullshit with us. I hope that uh, uh, next time you're in the Pittsburgh area, uh, you might hit us up and come hang out in the Cigar Cave with us in person. I have to confirm that last little bit that I added there. Yeah, no worries. But we'll he's right there, so I can confirm it like right now. <laughs> okay, so, well, I'll let him take a look at the writing at the bottom of this page and see if it's confirm doable. Confirm that you have it, that's all. Uh, but just remember, kids, you can watch this show live every Friday at 6 p.m. on our Facebook group, the Cigar Junkies Podcast Facebook group, and you can be involved in the conversation. If not, you can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as YouTube. Uh, thank you for stopping by. And uh, you can always get these beautiful T-shirts that we're wearing at the galaxyboutique.com. Use keyword junkies for uh, free shipping site-wide. Salud. All right, Steve, the recording is...